Hi, I'm pretty excited about today's review. On the workbench here is a Unity UTM13X oscilloscope demo board sent in from Unity. For those who have been following my channel, you know that I have reviewed a lot of oscilloscopes on this channel by now. Most of my reviews concentrate on oscilloscope bandwidth verifications, triggering of complex signals such as amplitude modulated signals, and the update rates, and so on and so forth. But some of the real-world scenarios are actually pretty hard to come by without an elaborate setup. This oscilloscope demo board actually will solve a lot of these problems. The UTM13X has many of these hard to come by scenarios built in. It not only gives you these run of the mill simple waveforms, such as sinusoidal, square wave, triangular wave, and the likes, it also can output some rather complex signals, such as wrong pulses and signals with rare glitches that are super useful for testing oscilloscope's capabilities. Besides these complex signals, it also has test outputs for many digital protocols which can be used to test the basic functionalities of the logical signal capturing capability some oscilloscopes offer, or you can use these test signals to test your logical analyzers. Of course, this board is also great for those who are learning electronics, as you can learn how to properly trigger on different types of signals and you can get yourself familiarized with different digital protocols. I could only wish I had a board like this when I started learning electronics. Anyway, time had changed. When I got started some 40 odd years ago, all I had was an analog multimeter. Nowadays, pretty much everyone can afford an oscilloscope. Anyway, you will definitely see me using this board in future oscilloscope and logic analyzer reviews. So in this video, I thought I would show you some of the capabilities of this Unity M13X demo board. There is a ton of feature and obviously I won't be able to show you every single one of them, but I will show you some of the important ones. Before I dive into the demos, let's actually take a quick look at the board itself. The brain of this board is a Spartan XC7S75 FPGA, and this is actually a very expensive part. In small quantities, it's over $100 a piece. Of course, the cost to Unity would be much less than that, as large companies like Unity typically have their own negotiated pricing with suppliers. Regardless, the bill of material definitely justifies the $199 price tag for the board. Depending on where you buy it, the price may vary a little bit, but that's the price quoted on Unity's website at the time of this recording. Besides the Spartan FPGA, we only have a couple more major ICs on the top side of the board. And here, this larger chip is an AD9122 high-speed digital-to-analog converter chip. It is a 16-bit 1.2 giga samples per second DAC. This part is also not cheap, retailing for over $70 for even large quantities. The smaller one here, that's an ADV7393, which is a 10-bit video encoder. And that's not surprising, as the board can also output video signals. Of course, you can see we have quite a few of these inductors, and from this, we can infer that we have quite a few DC to DC converters on board. So I'm guessing here, these are used to generate the different voltage rails required by the FPGA. Let me flip over the board and take a look at the back. Of course, as you would expect, most of these are decoupling caps for the FPGAs and larger chips on the other side of the board. But we do have a few ICs here, so let's take a look. Then here, this larger chip, that's a HC32L170, which is an ARM microcontroller. And here we have a CH340B, which is a serial to USB chip. And here we have an EEPROM in this cluster. And the only other chip is this windbound flash memory. And that's pretty much all there is on the other side of the board. Alright, back to the main side again. And here we have four of these BNC outputs, which can be conveniently connected to your oscilloscope inputs via BNC cables. Two cables are provided with the board. Now, what can be outputted from these four channels are slightly different. For example, channel 1 and channel 2 provide pretty much the same capability as they can output standard waveforms, rare waveforms, and digital protocol waveforms. Channel 3 can output protocol waveforms and video signals, and channel 4 can only output digital signals. So probably you have noticed that channel 4 does not have a relay here, as it's dedicated for digital signal output only. We'll take a look at these differences shortly. Now, of course, you don't have to use BNC cables. You can just hook onto one of these test points with your oscilloscope probes, which is very convenient. Also, if you're just testing digital protocol signals, you don't even have to worry about selecting anything using this rotary encoder. All the digital signals are actually accessible through these connection points around the board. We do have these headers here, and those are for you to hook up to a logical analyzer. This row here has 16 outputs, for the 16 bits, and here we break out 16 bits into two 8 bits groups. 
Using a logical analyzer, you can observe the decomposed waveforms, such as sine wave, sawtooth, and modulated signals on all these digital channels. Of course, you can also generate the protocol signals as well, similar to the test points around the board. Anyway, with the basics out of the way, let's actually hook up the board with my Unity UT3054X, and we'll try a few waveforms. Before I power on the board, I just want to show you these are the USB ports where you plug in the external power. Now, I do want to mention, let me zoom in here. You can see we have two of these USB ports. One says power, the other one says USB. And I tried it on my computer a little bit earlier. If I plug into the USB port, it does show up as a serial device. In the product documentation, it didn't mention anything about the USB at all. But I assume it was probably used for programming the board. Not really sure though. All right, now let me plug it in. Of course, I could use either of these ports, but let me plug in the power. And you can see it's booting up. By the way, it does take quite a few seconds for it to finish initialization. So we'll wait. And it will eventually, you'll hear, yep. So now it's done initialization and the board is ready. You can control the output signals via different channels using the onboard controller here. And let me quickly show you this. This is actually very easy to use. You can see here on the top level, we have channel one, two, three, four, and it essentially tells you which channel is outputting what. So let's actually take a look at channel one. So to do that, I select the channel one, and you can see we can either select normal waveform, which is the first option, or rare waveform, or protocol signals and capture rate, so on and so forth. So let's say if we want to do normal signal, we press that. And you can see we have your sine, square, sawtooth, and triangle, and so on and so forth. So let's actually take a look at the sine first. And of course, the frequency is fixed. That's 10 megahertz. And let's select that. So now, of course, I'm going to switch back to the oscilloscope. Before I show you the signal on the oscilloscope, just want to briefly mention the functions of these buttons. You can see here we have info that shows you what we're currently displaying. And it's a 10 megahertz sinusoidal. And then you can return to the previous manual. And the trigger is actually manually triggering the signal. The capture rate here is actually for dual pulses. We'll take a look at that a little bit later. Anyway, that was the 10 megahertz output. Let me actually acquire the signal here. And you can see it's a very clean 10 megahertz sinusoidal. Of course, as I mentioned, there are just a ton of these signals. I can't show you all of them. But let me actually pick a few simple ones and also pick a few complex ones, and I will show you. So the next one I'm going to show you, let's come back here, is normal wave. And let's take a look at the ASK signal. ASK is amplitude shift keying. So let me try to acquire the signal. And I don't think we can acquire that automatically. Yeah, you can see when you automatically acquire it, it doesn't quite look right. But let's actually try to set the trigger and uh, see what the waveform looks like. And here is our triggered ASK signal. Of course, it's still jumping a little bit, but that's because the intervals are slightly different between these signals. And if you look at the center part, this part is actually stable. So let me actually pause it and I'll show you. So you can see our signal, actually the spacing, they are different. And to trigger the signal, we have to set the hold off. You can see here, let me show you. And you can see the hold off is set at 10 microseconds. And the reason for that is because, let me show you here. So if I pause the signal, and you can see the spacing of the signal is roughly 10 microseconds. So this trigger setting is actually useful for triggering signals of these pulses. And the trigger hold off essentially says once it's triggered, we will wait for at least 10 microseconds before triggering again. And that prevents you from triggering a multiple of these bunched signals. And if you don't use this setting, the trigger won't be stable. Let's take a look. So for example, if I change the hold off to zero, and you can see that the signal is not entirely stable. And now we're looking at a phase shift keying PSK signal. And this signal is actually pretty difficult to trigger if you don't know what you're looking at. So there are multiple ways to trigger the signal. What I wanted to see is the abrupt phase shift. So for that, I actually selected the region you can see here, this trigger region. And what I did is, you can probably see my finger is a little bit dry, but I said the signal cannot cross this area. So that's actually how I get a stable triggering. Of course, you have to play around with the trigger a little bit, but if without this region, you can see, let me remove it. 
then you are actually not able to trigger the signal. But what we can also do is we can pause the acquisition, then you would be able to see occasionally, you can see here, it depends on where I paused it, you can see the phase shift of the PSK signal. So those are some of the simple waveforms. Now let's take a look at some of the more complex ones. The first complex one we're going to look at is a single short pulse. And this one is useful for testing your single triggering capability. And once I have selected that, all I need to do is you can see here, now this trigger light is lit. So when I press a trigger, and that will actually generate a single pulse. So let's take a look here. So for that, I'm setting my scope to single shot mode, and I'm going to trigger it. And you can see that we actually captured a single pulse. This pulse, because of the amplitude is so low, it is actually not very easy for some oscilloscopes to trigger. So you can see the amplitude is roughly 50 millivolts. That's indeed a very small pulse signal. And let's take a look at the duration. So the duration is roughly 2 microseconds. And the next signal we're going to look at is also a complex signal. This is essentially a clock signal with occasional glitch. And you can see the glitch once in a while popping up here and here. So this is actually very difficult to capture. Again, we can trigger on the region here. So to trigger on the signal, what I did is, again, I selected a region to trigger on the signal. And this region I selected as cross. So whenever the signal crosses this region, that's when it was triggered. And you can see that now we're able to capture this stable signal. Without this complex triggering, we won't be able to trigger on the signal properly. I think I'm going to show you a couple more signals. And the next one is actually a non-monotonic edge signal. And this signal actually is very difficult to capture because what happens is, let's try to stop the signal to see if we can see that. No, you can't. So it's not on this frame here. So what happens is the signal has some defects. Occasionally, the rising edge has some glitches. So we wanted to capture that. But of course, right now, we're not capturing that. So let's try to stop. And no, we're not seeing that. So this also requires us setting the trigger on a region. OK, so I adjusted the time base here. You can probably see this occasional signal. And you can see this signal occasionally is appearing. It has this abrupt amplitude change on the rising edge. So we wanted to capture that. Again, to trigger on that signal, we have to trigger on the region. And it does take quite a bit of patience. But you can see here, eventually, we are able to trigger on the signal stably. And you can clearly see the rising edge has some issues. This is what a so-called non-monotonic edge signal. Without this special triggering capability triggering on the region, you probably won't be able to trigger this kind of signal stably. And that's another reason why a lot of these scopes charge you so much for these additional triggering capabilities. Because signals like this with your traditional scopes with limited triggering capabilities, you just are not able to observe them. And the last feature I want to demonstrate is this so-called capture rate. And what it does is it actually generates two very short pulses of different spacing. So let's actually take a look. Right now, I set the scope to single shot mode. And for that, you can see I have already changed the demo board to capture rate. Of course, right now, I set it to be the highest. And here, we have a dedicated button to trigger that. Let's try to trigger it. Yeah, you can see we captured two pulses. Of course, we can do that again. And now you can see that the two pulses are actually very, very short. And let's change the time base here. Let's do it again. I'll show you. Yeah, you can see that essentially this is well within one microseconds. Of course, we can change the spacing. Let's come to the board. And let's come here, capture rate. You can see that was essentially the 5000K. And if I change it to 2500, what's going to happen is the spacing of these pulses is going to be longer. So let's take a look. And you can really see, let's go back and let's change the spacing to even longer. Capture rate, let's do 1000. And you can see that the spacing of the two signals are now longer. Right now, I'm using channel 3 to output a NTSC video signal. Of course, the signal is not properly triggered. We can adjust that. So let's come back to the trigger menu. And we can change the trigger type to video. And you can see here, we have different standard. So now it's PAL. We'll change it to NTSC. And we should already trigger the signal. Yep, you can see that we have triggered on the signal here. So this is handy for you to test the different triggering capability of your scope. 
Let's come back here. Let's see what else we can do. We can trigger on all lines, all lines, and line number, and so on and so forth. You can even sync on odd, even. Of course, these are just uh, triggering capabilities you can test with. And the last example I'm showing you is outputting a UR signal from channel 4, and we're decoding that signal on the scope. So as I mentioned earlier, there are a ton of these digital signals this demo board can output, but I'm not going to go through them one by one in this video. But in the future, when I review a logic analyzer, I think I'm going to revisit and show you all these capabilities. So as you can see, the demo board here is definitely very useful when testing out the capabilities of oscilloscopes. Also, it is a great educational tool for both beginners and professionals. I'm sure you will see me using this board a lot in my future reviews. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you liked the review, please remember to give it a big thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. Your participation makes videos like this possible. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.